I've got the word. It says you're live. <laughs> welcome, Hello, world. Marcus. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. You are very welcome. Um, so welcome everybody that's out there. Uh, it's great to have you along. Um, this week, I've got the fabulous Marcus Evans joining me, who is um, hopefully going to talk a little bit about uh, handicap play. And um, but obviously we want to hear a little bit about you first. And um, so I think we'll just crack on and find out who is Marcus Evans. Let's start with that. Sure. Yeah. So um, I live in Portishead in the southwest of England um, with my wife and two sons, one of whom had a birthday recently, which is why there's some balloons behind me. Um, so I haven't played as much um, croquet in the last few years as I used to when I was younger and more carefree, but that's absolutely fine. Enjoying life, um, working full time, time with the family and a bit of croquet on the side, uh, among other things. Um, I've been playing for 25 years, I think, properly, which seems ridiculous, um, but all very enjoyable. And I still really enjoy it. Um, all kinds of croquet, you know, from just knocking the ball around at the local club to playing in world championships. And um, I also love trying to help other people with um, a little bit of coaching when I can. And I hope that I might be able to give some useful tips today. Well, <clears throat> that is that is what we're here for. So let's start off. Um, so we've got a whole bunch of people watching. And if any of them have any questions, please type them in the chat. Otherwise, um, you know, feel free to, I'm sure Marcus is happy to answer questions by email later on. Um, so let's start with, um, well, the big question is, why does handicap play exist? What, what's the point of handicap anyway? Why, why are we even talking about it? Can you elaborate? Yeah, absolutely. So... The point of handicap play is to allow any two players to have a game against each other where they've got a roughly equal chance of winning. And uh, plenty of sports have some kind of handicap play. Um, I personally think the way Croquet does it um, or tries to do it is one of the best for reasons that I'll come on to. Um, and some sports don't have it at all, really. Um, some of them just don't really lend themselves to it. So, for example, football. Um, the most popular sport globally doesn't as far as I know have any kind of handicap system but I don't think it would really work you know if you have Manchester United playing against my local park team um, there's no real way to make it a level playing field um, I mean I can think of ways you could try by maybe they only have like four players and the other team has 11 that, that has been tried I think there are YouTube videos about that kind of match um, but it's it's kind of not really the same game. It's not the same challenge. Um, whereas croquet, you can have a, a beginner against an expert. And if the handicaps are correct, then in theory, um, the beginner could win the game. And I think that's a wonderful thing because it keeps that um, contact, I think, between all levels of the sport. And um, I think that's quite important and, and very enjoyable. One of the reasons that um, a lot of people enjoy playing it. So golf has, as in not golf croquet, but golf golf with a with a club and the little white ball. Uh, that that golf has a a handicap system. Um, I don't know a lot about golf. Is it similar, or is it? Do you play golf? I don't actually play golf, um, but I, I know a little bit about its handicap system. And, and as you say, that's probably the sport, um, the most popular sport, which has um, the best known sort of handicap play. Um, it's quite a different game, of course, um, from croquet in many ways, um, but in actually there are quite a few similarities. And I, my guess is that the croquet handicap system, when it was first um, brought into the game, I think about 100 years ago, some croquet historians can probably correct me on that. I suspect it was based on golf um, to begin with. The, the, even the numbers are quite similar. When you, you start at golf, I think you're given a handicap of 24, typically which is quite similar to what a lot of croquet clubs start at. Um, the idea in golf, um, obviously in golf, you're trying to take the fewest shots to get your ball from one end of the course to the other. Um, and the idea of the handicap is it gives you extra shots um, in which to achieve that, essentially. 
So if you have a, a golf course where the par score is 72 um, and your golf handicap is 24, if you do it in 96, which is 72 plus 24, then you've kind of done it just as well as somebody with a handicap of zero doing it in 72 shots. Go so or, already you can see some similarities to croquet there, because um, starting with association croquet, um, if you are a handicap zero in association, association croquet, in theory, that means that you can um, take both of your balls all the way around to the peg without needing any bisques. Um, and if you're a handicap of 24, in theory, it's going to take you 24 bisques to take both of those balls around to the peg. So as you said, as I said, um, I think some similarities there. Um, of course, what you have in association croquet is um, more interaction with the other player than you do in a typical game of golf. Um, and then things get more complicated and other considerations come into play, which we'll, we'll talk about a bit more later. But that's, that's the basis of it. Um, golf croquet, um, again, quite different because you have even more interaction with the other player. They can sort of actively try and spoil your position on a much more frequent basis than in association croquet. Um, and so uh, the golf croquet handicapping system, I think um, itself developed from the association croquet handicapping system, but um, of course it doesn't have the, the same sort of basis. It was probably um, a bit more of a finger in the air um, to start with, if you like, in terms of what's a reasonable gap between the very best players and beginners, how many extra turns is a, a beginner going to need to be an expert and um, that has expanded over the years. I think the first time golf um, croquet handicapping was properly tried, there was only about a gap of, of nine or 10 between the bottom and the top. And now it can be as high as um, 20 or, or more, I believe, which I think is, is a fair reflection and um, development. Um, and then, of course, um, we come on to um, advantage golf croquet, um, which is a relatively new method of handicapping. And the idea behind that um, was that it's, it's supposed to give a more sort of natural contest between the two players because the player who with the higher handicap doesn't have to think about the extra tactics of, of when they're going to use their extra turns, which um, can be quite difficult and certainly can slow the game down. Instead, it aims to give you a score differential to begin with. So again, just to go back to the football example, a bit like a, a football team um, starting 5-0 ahead, for example, and then seeing if they can stay ahead by the end of the game, um, in effect. And that's, that's effectively what advantage golf does. Um, as I say, the advantage is it's kind of a more natural way to play the game. It's it's more similar to level play golf croquet. You're, you're just trying to do your best with every shot. Um, but on the other hand, I personally think um, it's um, it does lose a little bit. Um, it loses some tactics when you don't have those extra turns to think about. And it's you know perhaps not entirely... Um, a satisfactory way of, of, of levelling the playing field. Um, but it, I'm not going to speak in favour of one or the other particularly. I think both golf croquet handicapping systems are interesting. I think both deserve to be played and, and tried and people can make up their own minds about which ones they prefer. I think there's, there is yeah, room I for mean, both. You still effectively, it, it, it doesn't matter whether you're playing a handicap game or an advan or advantage game of golf croquet, you still have a handicap. And so you're going to have to to get the handicap from somewhere i i guess um so so you still have to do the same sort of tests to get the handicap and obviously winning and losing your games will increase or decrease your handicap yeah absolutely just bear with me a second i'm just getting some feedback from another device in the room um hold on one second i'll just quickly mute that <laughs> no problem uh so i can see on my other screen that I've got a uh, a comment. Um, oh, Ang Harris, hello. <laughs> there was a hello, evening all. And Annabelle says when she started playing in the 70s, handicap started at 16, I see. And now, yeah, so I think we start at 24 now. Um, but it is a really good way of keeping a track of your handicap. Um, as in your yourself as a player. So we all have handicap cards and it's really important when you play your handicap games to keep those cards up to date because it's not just a record for you. It's a record for your opponent. It's a record for the Croquet Association to make sure everything is working. So handicap, uh, handicap play is actually really important for the sport as a whole, I believe, not just the players that play it. 
Um, anyway, sorry, I gabbled on for a little bit while you were looking for your feedback area there. Yeah, um, I found it. So I'll, I'll just quickly mention it as um, one of uh, my son's birthday presents was a little karaoke machine. And <laughs> for some reason, that started playing... <laughs> <laughs> our audio but sort of um 10 seconds later which i think is probably because my wife is watching it on her phone upstairs and, and it's all connected <laughs> modern technology is amazing isn't it's it it's fine it's, te- it's fine it's fine a few anyway, found- years ago i had a cat jump somewhere around my laptop so it's fine it's normal i found i found the off switch so that's that's all good brilliant um okay it's, it's talking actually you said you mentioned that you thought handicap came in maybe a hundred years ago this I, I guess may coincide with um it's the centurion of uh, the all England handicap uh, tournament um right. which I think you won I, I did yes I did um long time ago yeah in the year year 2000 so I, I won the the all England handicap um championship for association croquet which um I was very pleased with at the time well I still am to be honest you know why not um I haven't won very many tournaments and um I won't have any truck with though it's, it's only a handicap tournament. Well, sure, it's not the world championship, but you know, I think it's uh, a really good competition. And they they do say that the winner is um is just the title of the biggest um the, the player with the least accurate handicap in the country. That's what it it finds out, <laughs> which I suppose is true to to some extent because um if you are improving quickly and your handicap isn't quite keeping up with your improvement in play, then yeah, you're probably going to get. Um, more advantage than you should but that's just one of those things and it, it happens um, to somebody every year and that's just the way it is the handicap gets reduced and you know life goes on it's a great tournament I, I I play in it at my club to try and qualify every year some years I qualify some I don't and uh, and I've played it ever since I started from the very first year I started when when we started at the same club as you Nailsy and um since then I also now manage our area final and I I just I love it and it means that I normally get to to meet brand new players that have you know just come into the scene it's normally their first tournament maybe outside of their club which is why I completely advocate the uh, the All England Handicap I think it's a, a great tournament. I anyway. completely agree and um, just on, on that actually one other factor about it that I really like which I hope is still true because I haven't, haven't played in it myself for a few years although I used to as, as you said do the same as you but um, when I played in it it was played um, to full bisque handicap play which I think uh, I'm a huge advocate for um, and the reason goes back to what I was saying earlier about how the point of the handicap really is that um, it's how many extra shots you need to get both of your balls all the way around to the peg. Um, so if you are a handicap 16, say, or whatever, and you're playing a play on handicap zero, you'll get your full allowance of 16 bisques. And in theory, you can use those 16 bisques to, to make your breaks and, um, and win the game. Um, if you're 16 handicap playing a 12 handicap and you just take the difference of four, um, you get your four bisques, the 12 handicap gets no bisques. And that is a completely different game. Um, I personally think it, it's not as good a game because um, neither player then is really able to do, I think, what we really play association Craig for, which is to make a break, um, make a break as long as you can, all the way around if you, if you can, because isn't that the real joy of association Craig here, that you build up one shot after another and keep going? And those bisques just allow you to rectify the odd mistake and keep going, and I think that's great. So I'm a big fan of playing full bisque handicap wherever possible. Um, even and, and to as low a base as possible, even to a base of zero, which is how it was originally conceived. And I can understand why, OK, you might want to raise it a little bit to, to say a base of six so that you're probably going to run out of bisques before the end, essentially. Um, but um, the, the sort of games I just mentioned, uh, handicap 16 with four bisques against handicap 12, I think um, they, again, have their place and they have their fans. And I wouldn't take that away from anybody, but I would say that's um, less of a... I don't want to say real game because I don't want to offend people. And um, there's nothing wrong, as I say, with playing that sort of game, if that's what you enjoy. But I don't feel that's how um, it, croquet is sort of conceived of and, and what we really enjoy about it. I think I think you're right at this level, especially at this tournament, which is all about um, looking for those uh, improved players. It's about watching to see how they've improved and how they 
uh, use their BIS to set up that break and then continue their break. So uh, at the moment, I believe it's still base of 10. Mm -hmm. um, so which is what what we've been playing for the last few years anyway. Yeah. Uh, OK, so let's let's actually start talking about let's start with association croquet and then we can move on because extra shots and it will be we will be talking about um handicap play uh rather than advantage in in gc um but for ac you have the little white sticks you stick them in the ground and you get to you get to use them um yep. so i think the first and biggest question is when do you use a bisque yeah great question and um, it seems simple enough <laughs> well again i think um it's i i always start with the sort of theory of um let's take again the example of you've got however many bisques and you're playing somebody who is um handicap zero scratch player so in that case in theory as i say if you play to your handicap you have enough bisques to get both of your balls rounds and i'm a huge advocate of saying use them as soon as possible um, especially against a scratch player or below, because plenty of um, handicap games are won by A-class players um, where the other player still has bisques left and the expert player has, has just taken both their balls around and pegged out before all the bisques have been used, which is, needless to say, a complete waste. So definitely avoid that um, if you can. Um, and a good way to avoid that is by starting to use them right away. Now, I would temper that slightly by saying um, some uh, nasty expert players, um, myself included, might try and tempt you into using them before all the four balls are even on the lawn. Um, that is a less good idea for most people, um, simply because the fewer balls there are, um, the harder it is to make a break of multiple hoops. Um, and that's the reason, by the way, why, why by in a handicap game, um, you should nearly always choose to go second so that you're playing the fourth ball onto the lawn you get the first chance to use all four balls um, I'm sure most people already know this but it's just worth recording that fact if you're the lower handicap player who isn't receiving any bisques or not as many bisques um, the same sort of applies in reverse you want to stop your opponent having that first chance um, but let's assume that you win the toss get to go seconds um, when you play your fourth ball onto the lawn you should be looking for opportunities to use your bisques right away and there are plenty of coaching manuals that will tell you that wherever the four walls are, you can set up a break using two bisques. Um, and that should apply um, whatever your ability level, basically. Um, so do that, set up your break. If things go wrong, don't worry. That's what the bisques are for. Keep on using them, especially if things are still nicely or relatively nicely set up. Um, it's always very sad when you see a, a player um, use their two or three bisques to set up a break and then they make another mistake perhaps they're nervous at the start of the game it's very common happens a lot and they they just sort of throw up their hands um, metaphorically or physically or, or both and sit down in their chair again and say oh, I'm not playing very well today um, well you, you've just lost your best opportunity to change that um, use another bisque even if it takes you four or five bisques to make your first heap um, quite often that's a good investment and having done that um, and got all the balls in the right place, you can then sometimes continue the several hoops without needing another one, perhaps. <clears throat> so I would do that. Um, even if you use more than half of the first ball, um, get it as far as you can. Um, against an expert player, I would again say go all the way to the peg, um, certainly against a, a minus player. If they want to do some peels on you, they, they can if they want to. So don't give yourself the headache. Um, go all the way to the peg and then... Um, hope you get a chance with your second ball in due course. Um, so that, as I say, that's the sort of simple case because in in all those um, in that scenarios I'm imagining there, you've got lots of this because you're playing a, a zero handicap player, right? It does get a little bit trickier if you are not playing to a base of zero, so you've got fewer this. Then yes, you probably do have to be a little bit more selective, and um, there is something to be said for keeping at least one bisque back for later in the game, um, partly as a psychological weapon against your opponents. Um, and some people um, differ in their psychology as to whether they prefer to build up a lead and try and hold on to it, or whether they like the um, idea of trying to chase and catch up. Um, 
I personally, I think, probably prefer to be in the lead and, and try and hold on to it rather than catch up, although I, I feel like I can do either as needed, but other people might think differently. Um, anyway, um, yeah, by all means, keep one or two in reserve. Don't use them all in the first half hour of a three hour game. Um, but the same advice still applies, I think, in terms of those bisques are to help you make a break. And if you can set up a break using two bisques and um, take it through a number of hoops, that will give you a big advantage, I think, even if that's the only two bisques that you, you have in your um, pocket, as it were. So I'm going to avoid talking about ball positions on Zoom, because I think it's it can get quite complicated and you, you get people sitting there trying to figure everything out. And so uh, let's try to avoid doing that and, and doing a step by step walkthrough of where everything should be. Um, but I think as a I, I think as a general rule of thumb, if I have bisques and I'm going to start setting up my break, what I normally do is shoot at the ball the furthest away. Yeah, and I then take your bisque because then that will you can use that ball to to bring that in a little bit and then go to the next slightly further in ball and bring that one in a bit and then eventually bring them all into the lawn to hopefully gain that elusive four ball break status yeah absolutely and um as you say, without talking too much about the exact positions, I, I agree. Go for, you know, again, imagine you're playing fourth. Go for a ball that's a long way away. It probably will be. Um, if you miss it, take a best. You can croquet that to your hoop that you want um, and go to another ball. And then you might miss that. Never mind. Take a best. Croquet that to your next hoop that you'll be needing. Go to the third ball or fourth ball, whichever way you want to describe it. Again, you might need another best, but by that time, you should have a ball by your hoop, a ball by your next hoop, and you've used three bisques maximum. Remember, you might not have needed three. You might have hit something on um, any one of those. Um, and uh, and there's your break ready. So it is, I would think of it like an investment, um, those three bisques. Um, they're, they're never wasted if you use them in that way. Um, I think where they can be wasted is if you use them in a more defensive manner, like um, if you feel you, you have to shoot at your opponents and you miss and you think, oh, I better take a bisque, otherwise I've given them my ball. Um, that's not such a good use of it if you then don't um, turn it around and, and use it to your advantage. Um, I have to ask, you said earlier about those nasty A-class players, the expert players, um, that might tempt somebody into using a bisque. What might that attempt look like, just out of interest, for a friend, oh, well, asking for a friend? Well, I, I better not give away all my secrets, um, although <laughs> I, I don't play much handicap these days, not because I don't enjoy it, because I do. I, I just, um, as I said earlier, I have very limited time, so I tend to focus on the, the sort of um, uh, advanced level tournaments at the moment. But um, a very simple example would be, um, let's say you've been put in, let's say I'm, I'm playing somebody and they've put me in first, they've won the toss and put me in first, as they rightly should. Um, taking your first shot at hoop one um, is quite interesting um, because it's, you know, it's, it's not a good tactic. You're not thinking, oh, I'm going to be one nil ahead. Um, but if you get it, um, it can make them nervous immediately because they think, oh, gosh, look, how, look what a good shot that was. <laughs> not a tactically good shot but um <laughs> an accurate shot at least um and maybe if you end up in position you go for hoop two as well why not um but more likely it'll it'll miss and it more, most likely it'll hit the hoop and not go very far away um the point being that they then think oh well now what do i do um because of course they can ignore it and put their second ball their ball um a long way away um but if they do that, of course, on my next go, I've got a fairly short shot at this ball next to hoop one. I might be able to make hoop one with that ball and I might be able to make a three ball break. Um, so they're going to be, if they know that, they'll be thinking about that on the second turn and, and think, well, perhaps I'd better move this ball. And of course, if they go for it and miss, then they have got to take a bisque. And, and that bisque is, as I said earlier, not guessing its full value because they probably won't be able to get very far if they try and make a, a two ball break. That's pretty ambitious. So they've they've used a bisque in that scenario in a purely defensive way. 
um, or, or if they don't, so they've potentially given you a, a half a chance that you might not have otherwise had. So that's a really simple example of something that you, you might find. So if, let's say, an A-class player did go for hoop one and they did miss, then maybe a better option for the other player with the bisques is just to go sort of somewhere else as normal and let said A-class player take his short shot or miss it. It could be, and there's certainly something to be said for that. Um, let's say um, you went for the most defensive option, which is probably into the corner four, because it's the furthest away from um, any of the hoops that the A-class player wants to make. So they would probably go for their short shot, as you say, try and approach heat one. Uh, maybe they get it, but it's going to be hard for them to, to get a three ball break out of that. So, yeah, that's a perfectly reasonable option. Another perfectly reasonable option, especially true if you happen to be lucky enough to have half a bisque, um, is to um, go very gently for the short ball by hoot one. And if you hit it, that's great, because then you can play a croquet shot that moves both balls a long way away, which is probably the best thing to do. But if you don't hit it, you've left yourself a short shot where you do take a bisque or your half bisque if you have one because then at least you've only used half a bisque. Um, and, and again, just get the balls out of the way. Just, just don't give them that opportunity. So it's perfectly reasonable to do that. But um, what you want to avoid is the classic um, go for it sort of half-heartedly, um, end up almost as far the other side past, and then wonder what to do. Um, you've kind of got to take a bisque then, otherwise it's probably a double target for your opponent. So you take a bisque, then you miss going back the other way, and then, then it really is a waste <laughs> of a bisque. Um, so really important in all croquet, actually, and just like that example, is to make your plan before you take your shot. Don't get caught in two minds about it. If you're caught in two minds about it, make your decision and then play the shot full bloodedly as if it's going to go exactly as you wanted it to. And, Commit to um, it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you very much. And actually, that's really interesting because uh, that pesky half bisque, you never know what to do with it anyway and actually using it right at the beginning to help you um basically get the innings at the beginning of a game is such a clever idea I don't know why I've not thought of that before it's actually a well you don't get them that often that's the trouble um if you're playing someone who's uh, a minus one and a half um you might get them in that situation but unless your handicap ends in a half you won't meet someone else whose handicap ends in a half very often. So that's why you don't get them, them so much. But they can be really valuable because, as you say, there's a, there's a saying, actually, that you can sometimes use a half bisque more than once. Not literally. But what that means is because you've got a half bisque, maybe it's the only bisque you've got. You've just got a solitary half bisque. And well, what use is that? Well, actually, it can give you that confidence to go for um, a risky shot that you wouldn't have done otherwise. Um, because if you miss, you just say, well, I'll take my half bisque and, and eliminate the risk, um, eliminate the danger, exactly as in this case that I just mentioned. Um, but that extra confidence might help you hit the shot in the first place. And then you don't need to take your half bisque. You, you've achieved what you wanted. Um, and then if the situation comes up later in the game, you sort of take the same idea and you might hit it again. And you've used you've effectively used your half bisque again, um, potentially multiple times until you do come to that miss, miss where you do need to use it. So, yeah, that's um, very well worth thinking about. Um, the other good way to use a half bisque if you have one, um, if you don't need to use it in that situation, is, um, again, talking about using multiple bisques to set up a break, um, use it first. So we talked earlier about hitting the furthest ball and then just sending it to your next, um, sending it to your hoop that you're currently on. You know that you're not going to make that hoop straight away because there was nothing near it. That's why you've put a ball near it. So you know you're going to need to take another bisque to get going. So use your half bisque first, because you know you're not scoring any points that turn anyway. Um, get yourself set up, then take your whole bisque, and potentially you've used one and a half bisque, where otherwise you'd have had to use two. We like it. We li I think there's going to be lots of people out there going, oh, this is great. <laughs> well, it depends um, it depends who they've had coaching from. If they've had coaching from me, they, they probably, hopefully, already know it. Um, but obviously not a lot of people haven't. Um, a lot of people have had... Um, better coaches than me who would have I hope told them the same thing but as I said it doesn't come up with that all that often but it is worth knowing yeah I think one of the problems that I used to have with them is I forget and and actually it's quite funny because uh, I did actually play Annabelle um 
uh, this weekend just gone in a handicap game and she had a half bisque and she's just said, I should have used my half bisque against you. <laughs> she should have done. <laughs> so um, easy to forget. The advance. She won the advance game, so. You know. So, so it's, I mean, it's very much like um, forgetting your lift shot in, in an advanced game. And in fact, I, I know of uh, one player um, who some of you will know, but I won't name them, um, whereby if they concede a lift in an advanced game, they take off one of their shoes um, on the basis that when they do get up to play, if they've somehow forgotten that they had a lift, well, they'll, they'll soon remember when they haven't got a shoe on. <laughs> um, now, of course, if they concede a contact, they take off both shoes. Um what we've yet to determine, and we're a little bit worried about this, is if they were to ever um, get a lift a position in a super advanced game, what would they do having taken off both shoes? Anyway, I digress. That's nothing to do with handicap play. But <laughs> the point to remember is, um, yes, you're absolutely right. Always think about that at the start of your turn. What options have I got? Don't forget those bisques, um, even if it's just one solitary half bisque, because you never know when it could be useful. Uh, I've also known people to um, to uh, turn their mallet upside down and all sorts of things to remember things. So, yeah, that's true. OK, here's a big question. How would how does somebody get their handicap to go down? Because let's face it, when you first start playing croquet, everyone's the same. We're all obsessed and you get obsessed with your handicap. And the more obsessed with your handicap you get, the more difficult it is to, to bring the handicap down. But if we let's we'll try and be calm and we'll we'll sit down and listen to you very carefully. What would be your suggestions? Sure. Um, great question. Um, I think the first thing you've already sort of touched on is try not to be obsessed with the number that it is that the handicap or your index points or how many more wins do I need to get to the next trigger point to get my handicap down. Of course, we we all do it. I do it. Um, I have done it. I do it much less so now. But remember that the handicap is the result of good play and nothing else. Um, so there's no sort of amount of willing or wanting you can do to your handicap cards. If the results don't go your way, the handicap won't go the way you want it to. And thinking about it that way won't help. What will help is... Um, the key word for me is consistency, right? Um, the number of times um, I've come off after finishing a, a turn and someone said, oh, you make it look so easy. Um, and I usually say, well, actually, all the shots I just played were easy. Um, that's that's the point. And also, more importantly, whoever I'm speaking to, I will say, you can play all those shots. In fact, I've probably seen you play all of those shots. Um, the only thing you're lacking is doing them all over and over again consistently, one after the other, for the 50 or 60 or, or 70 shots that it takes to take a ball all the way around the curriculum. Um, so that's the key, is just being able to do that consistently. Now, OK, that's glib and, and easy to say. How do we get more consistent? Well, the boring answer and the, the correct answer is practice. Just do more of it. I'm good at it because I've done it um, tens of thousands of times um so that's the key is is just do more of it but but do it in the right way um, what i mean by that is um practice things that will make you good don't practice things um that will make it worse um what do i mean by that uh, let's take one example. So somebody at my club um, a year or two ago, um, as I was down there, just informally asked me for some advice. They were saying, um, I, I'm, I'm having trouble running hoops. Um, OK, let's have a look. So let, let me see you. Let me see you have a go at one. So they had a go at this hoop um, and it was about the ball. Uh, it was about four feet away. It was a four foot hoop. And I said, well, there's your problem straight away. You're trying it from too far away. Um, and I wasn't being silly. Um, I genuinely felt that, as you probably know, anyone who's watched sort of A-class players, they will always try and get to within a foot of the hoops, um, four feet away. Plenty of A-class players will, will miss a four-foot hoop every now and again. Um, some of them will miss them quite a lot um, <laughs> because they're not used to it. Um, they're used to being one or two feet away. Um, and it's amazing the difference that makes. Now, um, I was also able to give this player some pointers on how they might better manage with a, a, a four foot hoop um, but that central advice still applies and, and also 
you know, you play to your strengths. If you know you're having a day where you think, oh, I'm not very good at running hoops. Well, you probably need to be more aggressive on your hoop approaches from the side so that you're aiming to be only one foot away. And OK, sometimes you'll get an impossible angle because you've only aimed to be a foot away and you, you finished a few inches short or a few inches too long. We all know about the, the fan of success, as some people call it, or um, what, what do other people? It doesn't matter what you call it, but being in the, the, the right angle in front of the hoop is easier the further away you are. But if you take it too far and, and go too far away from the hoop to improve your angle, you're then um, are too far away for, for distance. So um, if you know that's a problem for you, just aim, you have to just aim to get in close and accept that it's going to go wrong more often. But overall, your success rate might go up, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, just uh, just consistency, just the things we, we always teach beginners, um, which I have to remind myself of. And so this is not um, talking down at anybody, just um, keep your head down or keep your eye on the ball. The two are equivalent. That's true of any ball sport. Um, well, any ball sport where you're looking down, it wouldn't do you very well serving at tennis, but um, that's an exception. <laughs> uh, yeah, keep your eye on the ball. What I always say actually is, um, I want you to tell me the color of the blade of grass that was under the ball. So you really focus on not lifting your head up. Um, accelerate your mallet through the ball, um, which is particularly important on gentle shots. Paradoxically, on, on harder shots, you'll do it naturally, but um, gentler shots, it's very easy to slow the mallet down as it reaches the ball to achieve a gentler shot. And that's the wrong way to go about it. You need to just take a smaller swing and then just still accelerate it slightly as you swing it forward. Um, and uh, and yet follow through, which is kind of the same thing. Um, and the yeah, that's kind of the same thing. The, the first part, of course, stalk the ball, get your body lined up in the right way to begin with. Um, and it's amazing how much difference that can make. And I think it was your, your dad that taught me that, actually, one of the um, best croquet coaches there is. And so he's got that famous saying, which um, I'm sure he and you might mind me repeating. If you always do what you always did, you'll always get what you always got. Um, in other words, you, you need to put a bit of effort in to, to making sure you do that. Um, again, just looking at, at players in my club, the amount of people I see um, who've got into bad habits of um, sort of running after the ball um, as soon as they've hit their shot, not literally running, but falling forwards um, when they should be keeping stable and keeping looking at the ball, lifting the heads, um, not following through. These are things we all do. These are things I've found myself doing, you know, recently. Um, which I've had to consciously correct. Um, it's amazing how far that will get you is just doing those basics right again and again and again. There's another another saying that dad says is uh, see it miss, hear it hit. Yeah, exactly. In other words, if you look up to see where the ball's going, which we all want to do because we're anxious yeah. about whether we fit it well, you probably won't have done because you've lifted your head slightly too early. So everything so moves. Miss. Yeah. Um, whereas if you keep your head down, you might not see it hit, but you'll hear it hit because you've hit a good straight shot in the first place. Yeah. So, yeah. Very good advice. Uh, so that there's something that I, um, you're, you, you play the piano, uh, as did I. <laughs> I do now badly. I try. But once upon a time, <laughs> I did quite well. Um, one of the things about practicing pieces is uh, for, for, for mu musicians is you have to practice the entire piece. Um, in sections um, if you always only ever start at the beginning and try and practice your way through you'll never actually get to the end in your practice uh, mm -hmm. and so you'll never really be able to play the end of it particularly well because by the yeah. time you get there ever it's so many things have already gone wrong and I liken that to croquet quite often and I was actually wondering your thoughts on that whether you might suggest people practice a certain you know for example, even I know it sounds ridiculous, but in golf croquet, practicing a shot that you will always take, i.e. from north of hoop two over to hoop three, you run the hoop, practice taking that positional shot. It, it's yep. a good idea, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. But um, I also agree with you about breaking it down and um, yeah, practicing different things um, at different times as well. So the, it, the temptation, I think, always is when you go down to the croquet club, for me anyway, and I'm sure a lot of people, is you set the hoops out and you think, oh, let's have a, a practice game against myself, um, because croquet is great for that. Um, one of the few sports where you can have a, a sort of sensible game against yourself. Um, the only other one I can think of is squash. Um, but that gets far too tiring after a while. 
Um, so yes, uh, the temptation is to do that, and and it's very much like, as you said, um, the piece of music where you um, start off quite well, maybe because you've practiced that bit a lot, but you you're not focusing your practice, and and focusing your practice is very important. Um, so I, I will just share a few little practice routines which other croquet players have passed on to me. So I can't claim any credit for these. Um, what I will say is that they are recommended for all levels. They're still recommended for you know, top international players just as much as um, people who are um, still very much learning the game, wanting to get their handicap down from, from say, double digits to single digits or, or just even, um, beginners. Um, so one I find my go to that I find very useful to try and um, see how straight I'm hitting the ball is to um, put two balls on the boundary line, another two balls, um, say, starting three or four yards away. Um, and you shoot one ball at one and then shoot the other ball at the other. Um, if you hit both both shots, you can step back. Um, you can either do it in increments of two yards or one yard. I, I would say, um, let's say one yard. So you, you mark the positions, move back a yard, and then you've got two one yard longer shots than you had last time. Again, if you hit them both, move back another yard. If you only hit one of the two, stay where you are and repeat. If you miss them both, move in a yard. And it doesn't take very long for you to probably reach some sort of equilibrium where you're hitting one in two fairly consistently. And whatever that distance you've got to is, you then know that's what we call sometimes your critical distance. That's where your, your distance where you can expect to hit roughly half the shots that you take. Um, and that can be quite useful to know then um, in games to calculate um, your chances as to whether you think it's a good idea to go for a certain shot um, or not. Um, but also just very good practice hitting the ball straight. Now, it's really important to um, treat each shot exactly as seriously as all the others. Um, and that's, I think, what I mean by focus practice, um, as well as focusing on one thing. It's focusing on the shot, try and make it as much like a real game as you can, which is one of the hardest parts about practicing. But you have to try and get into that mentality of, of it is really important whether I hit this or not, um, just so that you are, um, as we say, practicing like you play. Um, now, the other side of that um, is, um, again, stealing a, a phrase from somebody else, uh, play like you practice. What does that mean? That means that, um, again, a bit like playing a piece of music, if you've practiced something enough times, you don't need to put much conscious thought into it. Um, it's all um, physically in your muscle memory, if you like. Um, and that's essentially another difference between the very best players and the rest is um, not necessarily that they can play different shots or amazing shots. It's that they can play the basic shots so well and have done it so many times that it doesn't matter the situation. Um, they are so used to playing it, it, it's well within their comfort zone. Their comfort zone is, is just bigger than everybody else's. So that when they do have to play a slightly more difficult shot and they're under pressure in the match situation, it's still within their comfort zone. That applies just as much to handicap play. Um, I know it's um, very common for people to play well in practice, but then get nervous when they're in a, a match situation. Um, even if it's a, a club game or a um, club competition or a tournament, whatever it is. Um, if you have practiced what you're aiming to do, it just gives you that underlying confidence that you can do it. Um, and even if your nerves start making your hands shake a little bit or whatever, um, you just can get over it because you're you're used to playing those shots. You, you're not doing anything that you, you haven't done hundreds of times before. Um, as I say, very similar to performing music um, on stage or, or whatever. They do, the top players seem to have this amazing trust in themselves. And th I think that, that, you know, they do play like they practice because they, they trust that this shot is going to work because they've made it work a thousand times before, I guess. Um, but it's, it's blooming hard to think that when you're on your lawn and the knees are knocking and your opponents sat there pacing around because they're waiting for the next straight to go just as badly as the last one and you're getting further and further and further away from the four ball break. It's really hard. <laughs> it is, yeah, but um, I'm not saying it's necessarily easy to do. If it was easy, then everybody would be amazing players, I guess, and you know, that, that's not the case. That's what makes it interesting that we're all striving to get to the next level, I suppose. Um, um, we, yeah. we talked earlier about using bisques in, in association croquet. 
Um, we've obviously moved on to practice routines, which are your practice routines. It doesn't matter whether you're an AC player or GC player or both, obviously. They're relevant to everybody. Every croquet player should be practicing the those sort of strokes and, and getting those as perfect as you can. Um, but if we can now move on to using your extra turns. Mm -hmm. Um, now, obviously, we might move on to playing advantage croquet rather than handicap. But I I would still suggest, even if that happens, maybe in, in your club, arrange to play an actual handicap golf croquet game as a, fr as a friendly. I mean, obviously, us croquet players, we don't really have true friendlies, do we? <laughs> um, but as a friendly, because I think this is going to help people progress people learn and and get the chance of the positional shots as well as the hoop running etc because otherwise you might just get bashed away even if you start five hoops behind so if we can just have a little talk about using your extra turns when to use them or why yeah absolutely um so interestingly and i, I will make this about golf croquet which i also enjoy playing um but i there are some parallels in what i said earlier um in that i think in golf croquet it's best to use your extra turns early and use them in an attacking way and not in a defensive way and again this is nothing new this is not something i've come up with and you can read more about it in um, a lot more detail in the various books um, that people have recently published on the subject um, but uh, take a very simple example in golf croquet. Um, let's say you've got some extra turns and you get to go first and you play your ball towards hoop one, as, as we all do. Um, let's imagine you get it in a really good position, actually. Um, and you're say you're playing against um, the expert golf croquet player who's known to hit long clearance shots quite often. Uh, why not use one of your extra turns to play your ball into the jaws of hoop one? Well, suddenly, if you achieve that, you've made their clearance almost impossible, no matter how good they are. You've virtually guaranteed hoop one for one extra turn. Um, and not only that, if you get into the draw as well, you might be able to get through a long way up to hoop two and possibly even get two points out of it, um, which is quite a good general principle to think of with, with extra turns. Um, that's the simplest example, um, but it can apply at, at any hoop and particularly the odd number hoops. where, as I say, if you can get in the jaws with an extra turn, um, then get all the way down to the next hoop on your next go. Um, that's a, a really powerful use of one if you can engineer that situation. Um, Clever. Quite, often, quite often you do see, I think, in, in golf croquet, people using their extra turns to... Uh, clear their opponents away if their opponent's in a, a good position to score the hoop and um, that's much less useful I think because unless you can clear them away in such a way as um, your ball remains in a hoop running position which can happen and it's worth looking out for those opportunities um, but if you don't do that um, they're just going to use their next shot to come back to the hoop and you've not really gained any benefit from your extra turn so that's what I mean about a defensive use of an extra turn which I was tend to feel is is not using them to their um, best capability. Now, now interestingly, I, I know um, we're still talking about handicap, but just briefly on advantage, um, I haven't, I've played very few games with advantage golf croquet, but I will say, I think a similar idea can come into play there. Um, let's say in this example, that's, um, I mean, I think, I think what advantage is all about, it seems to me is um, just giving the higher handicap player more chances to play a good shot. Um, so what do I mean by that? Well, um, again, let's just take the same very simple example. You're the higher handicap player in advantage. You play your first ball um, over to hoop one, and it, let's say it ends up in a, a really good position, and your opponent, who's a low handicap, maybe they miss their clearance. Um, and so you you get a chance to run hoop one. Um what it's kind of saying, I think, advantage play is that you um, that that's not going to happen very often, right? Because if the higher handicap player was really good at always getting in front of hoop one, they'd be a lower handicap to begin with. But sometimes they will do it, you know. Um, and on those occasions when they do do it, they're going to score. Um, let's take another example of, let's say, the lower handicap player runs hoop one not very far then you've got a chance, the other higher handicap has got a chance to approach hoop two from down by hoop one. And again, 
a lot of the time their ball won't go in a very good position but for the times when it goes in a great position or even into the jaws of hoop two they've scored one of the points that they need um and again it's just about generating those opportunities i think um and you can think of extra terms extra turns in golf crack i think in a similar sort of way it's just allowing you to generate an opportunity to score a point that you wouldn't have had otherwise okay um Let's say you're a high handicap player and you've had all these bits and you've been doing really well and you've been, you know, or extra turns or whatever it is you've been doing and you've been racking up those wins. And then you find yourself halfway through the season, all of a sudden, where the other person has the extra turns or the bisques. What sort of advice can you give it's so hard when that happens. And there, I know there are players out there that I mean, it happened to me and I think I just had to suffer it for a couple of years. I don't think I ever figured out what to do. Um, but th it's that transition, um, you know, between giving a, between receiving all of the extra turns and then giving them away and understanding the difference and understanding essentially how you can switch your mindset to then be the inverted commas better player? Sure, uh, great question. Um, well, the first thing I would say is that um, it happens to virtually everyone that they have this sort of issue or, or even more generally that um, your handicap at some stage will go up. I, I, I bet the list of croquet players whose handicap has never gone up, um, you could probably count on one hand. Um, virtually everybody at some point in their croquet career will have had a, a bit of a dip in form or struggle with a new situation where the handicap has gone up. But it certainly happened to me. It's happened to, as I say, nearly all A-class players and nearly all players. Um, it's a perfectly natural thing to happen. It's not something that you need to or should worry about if you can. Um, it just indicates exactly that a temporary loss of form it doesn't take much for your handicap to go up after all just a few losses in a row um, some of which could be bad luck bad weather not feeling very well whatever so try not to worry about that again just focus on the um the technique the way that you play the game and what the handicap or index number says is, is unimportant that will follow um I would also just reiterate again what I said earlier about full bisque play and association croquet. If we did more full bisque play, the point you raised about struggling when you suddenly have to give bisques would be much less common um, because you'd still be receiving this for a lot longer, um, just not as many as you were before. And that makes it um, much easier, I think, to make that transition because you're not losing all your bisques suddenly, you're just gradually getting fewer and fewer of them. Um, however, at some point, as you say, um, you will reach that stage. Um, again, I think I would try and forget about the situation and just focus on playing your best croquet. The reason your handicap came down was because you got better at consistently playing those shots that I mentioned earlier. Um, I, I didn't mention any specific shots, but any shots it just means you've got better at consistency. Um, because your handicap only comes down if you consistently win and you only consistently win if you play your consistent shots. Um, so none of that has changed when your handicap comes down. You've just got a little bit less help in terms of the bisques to do it. Now, yeah, sure, there can be a, there's a clear difference. Let's say your handicap is eight and um, your first game for tournament is against somebody who's zeros. So you get eight bisques. Oh, great. I know how to use the, I know how to use two to set up a break and then I probably won't need many more and so on. And you win. And then the next game, you're playing a handicap 16. And let's say it's not a full bisque tournament. So suddenly you're giving away eight bisques. Well, uh, yes, that does require a, a bit of a change of mindset. Um, we talked earlier a little bit about ways you can perhaps try and encourage them to use their bisques um, so that they are hanging over you a bit less. Um, but I wouldn't spend personally spend too much time worrying about that um, at the end of the day they are going to run out at some point don't forget that so it's important not to panic um, and even if they get a long way ahead by using their bisques well of course they have that's what they're for um, the only way I think to to deal with it is to continue playing attacking croquet continue trying to set up breaks yes there will be times if you do that where you set up a break and then make a mistake and your opponent then has your break nicely laid out 
for them instead. That's sad. Um, it does <laughs> happen. You might lose a few games. Your handicap might go up. Um, but if you keep on doing that, um, after some time, you will not make that mistake. And then the break will be yours and you will benefit from it and so forth. So that would be my advice is keep on going for it. It's it's a much more enjoyable game to play as well, even if you suffer those those few losses and you worry about your index points being lost and your handicap going up and so on. I would strongly advise um, try not to. Croquet Association Croquet in particular, I think, is a great game because it's um, you against the equipment as much as it is you against your opponent. Um, and uh, in some ways can be viewed almost as an art form in that respect. Um, you are challenging yourself to play well and produce a, a beautiful game, if you like, and your opponent is almost irrelevant. Um, golf croquet a little bit less so, admittedly, and that's what people like about it, after all. Um, that's what I like about it. It's, it's more combative, I suppose. Um, but the same principles apply in terms of you keep on trusting your technique, practicing your technique, practicing those shots, and um, particularly ones that you know that maybe you're not so good at. And um, you have faith that it will come together because it will. And that's my experience anyway. OK, I, we're, we're coming up to an hour and I try and keep it to an hour-ish so I think to, to, to leave us on um, finally uh, I, I would really like to give everybody um, the answer to what what next what happens next so you've done your handicap you've brought your handicap down you've been playing in your handicap games you you've gone and played in the All England um, now what what would be your suggestion? Well, I think it comes back to what I just said um, for a large part of it in terms of you can keep on achieving new things if you want to. Um, you know, in your case and, and mine and plenty of others, you know, maybe you've won some handicap tournaments, maybe then you win some level play tournaments and um, perhaps C level or B level tournaments. If you keep progressing, you can enter and win A-level tournaments and so on, potentially even playing international matches. Um, but, you know, that's not for everyone. I'm not saying that's that's certainly not the be-all and end-all for me, at least, um, although I, I do enjoy that side of it. It's the, the constant challenge of, can I achieve this as well as I did last time or a bit better than last time? Um, practice routines that challenge you are really good for that. Um, the, the one I mentioned earlier is a very simple example. There are plenty of others. Um, you know, a simple, very, very simple one. Um, start out with a one foot straight hoop, run it gently, turn around and run it back the other way. How many times can you do it? Um, really, really useful practice routine if you treat every shot as important and don't rush and think this is the next hoop I need to get to, to win this game or whatever. Keep the pressure on yourself. I, th I think um, we're, we're quite lucky in that we've also got a lot of opportunity for different types of competitive play so with you know at, at a lot of the clubs there's internal club competitions and I always advocate just go in for all of the competitions that you can um because that even if you you know it's an open tournament you get to play against the best players in the club you're always learning which is great you know but there's league play there's the different I think you mentioned the different series like C level B level etc uh -huh. um and I I mean, I'm I, I'm guessing that you're similar to me in that you advocate people striving to get into the better the better tournaments, um, even if you maybe your handicap doesn't it might not quite look like you should be there. Just do it anyway. I do, but um, and and I think you also you learn a lot more and a lot more quickly by playing against better players. But um, as I said, I don't think it should be the be all and end all. And actually, the reason I've um, still enjoy playing this after twenty five years, and obviously I'm not alone in that, is um, I know it's a cliche to say it certainly is where I work. Whenever anyone leaves, say what do you like, what did you enjoy most? Oh, it's the people. Well, actually, it is um, the people that you meet and socialize with and play against. Um, is I think by far the most important thing and for that reason it doesn't actually matter um, what level you're playing at because there are interesting and, and funny and charming people at all levels of croquet we're very lucky in that I think I think it attracts them um, uh, so it, certainly it gives you that common ground that degree of like-mindedness um, so 
yeah, that's the most important thing, I guess, is to keep playing at, at whatever level of croquet. Try and do your best by all means. If you want to keep on improving, um, yes, practice hard and work hard, but it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is to enjoy the game and the um, socialising that comes with it, I think. Talking of people, uh, later in the season, you will, of course, be meeting up with lots of people that you know from all over the world. Um, croquet players uh, from near and far uh, in the Association uh, Croquet World Championship, which I know that you have your place. Mm-hmm. Um, I also know that in 2012, you reached the semi finals. That's correct. So I'm guessing, you know, it's going for glory this time round, you know? I <laughs> won't deny that it's always been an ambition of mine. I'm, it, I wouldn't say in life I was a, a terribly ambitious person. I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually quite easily pleased in a lot of ways, which is, I think, a, a great blessing because um, it makes a lot of things um, a lot easier and happier. But um, that said, yes, when it comes to croquet, that is certainly an ambition to go one or two better than last time. Um, it won't be easy. It will involve a lot more practice. Um, for the last uh, World Championships I played in, which was in 2013, I practiced um, early in the morning before work. I should be trying to do that again um, as much as possible. Um, enjoying the the sunny mornings when we get them. The weather here is, um, and I think most of the country has been horrendous the last few weeks. Um, that's all going to go away and we're going to have um, lovely days where we can practice and enjoy the game even more. And um, yes, I will be trying to play my very best, but uh, if I don't win the thing, I will still enjoy it. For sure. And it's going to, it will be amazing. Uh, I mean, to see everybody coming over here and it's always lovely seeing everybody when they, when they turn up for the, the, for the big tournaments anyway. So uh, very looking forward to, seeing all of our friends from across the world. Um, I've got a, I have got a quick question and I, I know I'm going to sure. sneak it in at the end. Um, uh, it's from Gerald here and uh, who says, how do you suggest using bisques in short croquet? Oh, good question. I, yes. It really is. And so I had to throw that in at the end because actually I know that you are a bit of a fan of short croquet as am I it's quite fun to play it so this is very relevant so thank you very much for the question so if you wouldn't mind not at all it certainly is relevant and um, actually short croquet is an excellent example because it is um, by default a full bisque game which is what we were talking about earlier in other words you always have your number of bisques or in some cases a number of peels to achieve in every single game Um, I think that's a great advantage of it compared to um, some other forms of croquet because you should, in theory, be right in your comfort zone or at least on the edge of it um, every single game Um, because you know exactly what you've got to do and you know that in the past you have achieved um, a win with the number of bests you've been given. So um, to that end, I would repeat my advice from earlier that I would use them as soon as possible because um, your opponent, of course, is in exactly the same boat. And if they get to use theirs first, and if they play well, they might win no matter how well you're playing. Um, so you've really got to use yours first and, and put your, give yourself that opportunity, um, because it almost doesn't matter what their handicap is, I think. Um, it, when it you, said, you said play as you practice, if people are playing with bisques, would you suggest practicing with bisques? Yeah, definitely. Um, short croquet, again, is a, a great example where you can you can do exactly that. Um, I know I said earlier that you shouldn't always just play a game against yourself, but I think it is a useful exercise to do sometimes, just not all the time. Um, so short croquet is ideal for that as well, because it's a, a shorter game. You've got a fair chance of actually getting through a, a whole game in a practice session. Um, and you can practice strategies um, that you think or, or hope will work. Um, you should hit in a bit more often than you do on a, a full size court because the distances are shorter. So, um, and yeah, on a, I can't remember what the short Craig handicaps are off hands, but um, you know, most people, um, until you get down to a, a association Craig handicap of about two, you have at least some sort of bisques. Um, if you only have a half bisque on its own, okay, yeah, that's not particularly useful for setting up the break. As we said, you've kind of got to 
just treat that as um, a free go at shooting your opponent, hopefully. And if you miss, you take your half bisque. Um, hopefully you hit and then you get to do the same again later on, as we already discussed. If you've got one bisque or more, um, I mean, if you've only got, say, two bisques, OK, you don't necessarily want to use both those bisques to set up your break. But on a short croquet court, hopefully you only need one because the distances are shorter. You can play um, you know, more expansive shots to, to get that break set up. So, yeah, if you've got two bisques in short croquet, one to do your first break, one to do your seconds. You've only got to do six hoops, so you won't make a mistake because you haven't got to move the balls very far. Um, yeah, sure, you can practice that. So practice that, master it, win five games, and on to the next level. <laughs> Excellent. Good advice. Uh, well, uh, I think that's uh, going to be time. Thank you so much for giving up your time. Um, thank you, Emma, for giving up the time. I doubt she's um, still watching, but uh, um... thank you. <laughs> Um, and it's been great fun and I hope everybody um, that's that's watching has enjoyed it if anybody does have questions feel free to write it on the um, the YouTube channel thing and I'll, I'll try and uh, feed answers back and um, I have no idea if we'll do another one of these I hope so because I think it's really good fun um, but we'll we'll just we'll have to see I put a few feelers out for people that might want to join me but some people are a bit scared of coming and chatting to me. I don't know why. I'm kind of no, nice. Nothing to be scared of at all. I mean, <laughs> surely croquet is, okay, it is full of introverts, but it's also full of extroverts, surely, who, you know, like me, don't mind, um, you know, being able to talk for an hour um, without being interrupted, especially when you've got children, is, is very rare. Um, <laughs> so thank you for having me for the opportunity to do that. And I hope some of it's been interesting to um, some people. Uh, I mean, I think it's been fantastic. So and I'm sure everyone else agrees. So thank you very much. And um, and I'll, I'll see everybody else uh, uh, next time if, if we get the opportunity. Uh, bye. You. <laughs> bye. Ta-da. You're done. <laughs>